Welcome to the Deep Dive. We dig in the latest topics to figure out what really matters. And today, well, we're looking up, way up. We are indeed. We're taking an in-depth look at a celestial event that's just uh, starting to get everyone talking. Comet C2025 R2 Swan. You might have also seen it called Swan 25B. Right, Swan 25B. It's a non-periodic comet, and the big news is, you can actually see it now, it's creating a lot of buzz among stargazers. And for good reason. It's quite a rare opportunity, really. A little window into the solar system's past. Exactly. So our mission today is to explore the science, the, you know, the, the history, the future of this visitor. We've got star charts, social media chatter, the latest astronomy research. All the good stuff. Okay, let's unpack this. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, this isn't just any comet. Its discovery was quite recent, September 11th, 2025. Just days ago. By an amateur, Vladimir Bazugli, using images from Soho's Swan instrument, which is fascinating in itself. It really is. And what's really intriguing, I think, is why it popped up seemingly out of nowhere. Why wasn't it spotted sooner? Good question. It raises questions about, you know, how we watch the skies. But our goal here is to give you, the listener, a clear understanding of this event and why it's significant. It's quite a story. And that discovery by Bazigli, I mean, it really shows how amateurs still play such a huge role, doesn't it? Even with spacecraft like So out there. Absolutely. Citizen science is crucial. So Bazigli spotted something unusual in the SOHO imagery. Now, SOHO is the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, right? Correct. And its SWAN instrument, Solar Wind Anisotropies, its main job is actually monitoring solar wind. It looks at the sky in a specific light, Lyman Alpha. Uh -huh. Tracking hydrogen atoms, essentially. But because it has this super wide view, it doubles as a pretty effective comet hunter, apparently. It does. It sees things other surveys might miss, especially things releasing hydrogen, like active comets. And Bazigli's find was confirmed quickly by other amateurs. They pegged its magnitude at 7.4. And it already had this uh, distinctive two-degree tail that's pretty noticeable. It is, especially for a fresh discovery. It tells you it's quite active. And this isn't the first swan comet this year, is it? There was C2025 F2. Ah, yes, F2. That one, unfortunately, didn't make it. It disintegrated. Right. But this one, R2, seems much more, well, robust. It sailed through its perihelion, its closest point to the sun, just on September 12th. And it got pretty close. Only half an astronomical unit, about 75 million kilometers. Wow. And that close pass explains its rapid brightening, going from magnitude 11 way back in August up to magnitude 8 by September. Definitely. That solar heating really gets the ices, vaporizing water, carbon dioxide, methane probably. Classic comet behavior, but quite vigorous in this case. Here's where it gets really interesting, though. Why the delay? Why did it take so long to spot something this bright? Right. And what's fascinating here is the likely culprit something called the Holacek effect. Holacek effect. Okay, tell me more. Well, it basically describes how things like comets get really hard to see when they are near the sun in the sky from our perspective, say within about 30 degrees. Ah, uh, because of the glare. Exactly. Solar glare is the main issue. Plus, our own atmosphere interferes more when you're looking low near the horizon where the sun is rising or setting. It creates this kind of observational blind spot. So for C2025 R2, when was it in this blind spot? The critical period seems to have been from about August 7th right up until September 13th. It basically emerged from the sun's glare just in time for Bazoogly to spot it. Incredible timing. It really is. And it's, you know, it's not just a technical hurdle. It's a reminder that even with our big fancy sky surveys like PanStars and ADALAS. Which finds tons of asteroids and stuff. Right. They do amazing work, but they often aren't looking that close to the sun. So there are still gaps. And that's where dedicated amateurs, people like Bazoogly, make such a difference. They fill those gaps. So if even our advanced observatories have these blind spots near the sun, does this Holacek effect mean we could be missing other things too? Maybe like potentially hazardous objects? Or is it mostly comets? That's a really good question. The effect primarily impacts anything getting very close to the sun. Most potentially hazardous asteroids, the PHAs, we track them when they're further out. Okay. But yes, the principle applies. Any object coming in from that direction, comet or asteroid, could be hidden for a time. So it definitely keeps astronomers on their toes. It reminds us we can't assume we see everything. Makes sense. And it also shows why instruments like SWAN, even if designed for something else like solar wind, turn out to be unexpectedly vital. And why, once something is spotted, moving quickly to calculate its orbit is so critical. Yeah, I bet. How do they do that so fast? Well, as soon as Bazigli reported it and it was confirmed, the global comet community jumped in. 
They use observations from multiple points to calculate the orbit, the path it's taking. Yeah. It's done using uh, ephemerides data. Ephemerides. Like a celestial timetable? Sort of, yeah. It predicts future positions. And sophisticated systems like JPL Horizons refine these calculations incredibly quickly. It's a world away from doing it by hand like in the old days. I can imagine. And these calculations confirmed perihelion on the 12th, like we said. And importantly, they nailed down its closest approach to Earth. That's coming up on October 19th. How close will it get? About 0.26 AU. So roughly 39 million kilometers. Close, astronomically speaking, but perfectly safe. Good to know. And you mentioned it's non-periodic. Right, which basically means it's a long period comet. Its orbital period, the time it takes to go around the sun, is likely way over 200 years, probably thousands, maybe even millions of years. Wow. So real long haul traveler then. Yeah. If we connect this to the bigger picture, that long period strongly points to an origin way out in the Oort cloud. That's the prevailing theory, yes. The Oort cloud is this, well, it's still hypothetical, but thought to be a huge spherical shell of icy bodies surrounding the whole solar system, vastly far away. Like leftovers from when the solar system formed. Exactly, primordial stuff. So C2025 R2 is essentially a visitor from the deep freeze, nudged inwards perhaps by a passing star or galactic tides, Billions of years ago, potentially. And its path confirms that. It's heading back out. Yeah. After it swings by Earth in October, it's on its way out of the inner solar system. It might not come back for, well, millennia, if ever. It really is a fleeting visit. M makes seeing it now feel even more special. It does. It puts our little moment in time into perspective, doesn't it? Absolutely. And if you do want to see it, there's some great help out there. There's a chart by Edwin Quayle that's getting a lot of attention online. Uh, yes, I saw that. Very useful. It maps the comet's position from September 13th through to the 30th. So as of today, the 17th, where should people be looking? Okay, so you want to look in the evening sky not too long after sunset. Find the constellation Virgo. The bright star Spica is your main guidepost. It's a magnitude plus 1.0 blue giant, quite bright. Okay, Spica and Virgo. And Mars is also nearby, a bit to the east. It's that reddish object, magnitude 1.8, so even brighter than Spica. They make a nice pair of markers. The comet itself is predicted to be around magnitude plus 6. Which means binoculars. Uh Telescope. Yeah, plus 6 is right on the edge of naked eye visibility under perfect, really dark skies. But realistically, for most people, you'll want 50 millimeter binoculars or a small telescope. Got it. And what about the tail? It has that two degree tail. Right. To spot that faint fuzziness, try using averted vision. Don't look directly at where the comet should be. Look slightly off to the side. Your peripheral vision is more sensitive to faint light. Ah, oh, good tip. Best time. Probably around, say, 6.40 p.m. local time once twilight deepens, but before it sets. Check your local listings or an app. And challenges. Light pollution, obviously. That's the big one. Getting away from city lights helps immensely. The moon is also a factor. It's a waxing crescent now, so it'll set fairly early, but its light can still wash out faint objects. So find dark skies if you can. Use an app like Stellarium or Sky Safari. Definitely recommend those apps. They can show you exactly where to look, and some can even integrate Quail's chart data. Super helpful. Now, you mentioned Quail's post. What's fascinating here is that he also hinted at something else, another comet. Yeah, that caused a bit of a stir. Initially, people thought maybe he meant C2025F2, the one that broke up. But then rumors started flying on X uh, social media about a new possible candidate. Maybe another swan discovery. A double comet. Seriously. <laughs> it would be amazing if confirmed really rare. It reminds me of 2020 when we had Neowise and Atlas in the sky around the same time. A fantastic sight. Wow. So astronomers are definitely keeping a close watch on that part of the sky near Virgo. We'll have to wait for confirmation, but fingers crossed. Keep an eye out for updates. Okay, a potential double comet. That's exciting. Yeah. But look, with all this excitement, people grabbing binoculars, telescopes, mm -hmm. we absolutely have to stress the safety aspect. Crucial point. Yes. Observing comets is generally safe. Naked eye, binoculars, fine. But never ever point binoculars or a telescope at or near the sun, especially since this comet was near the sun. Absolutely not. Even during sunrise or sunset, the sun's rays are concentrated by optics and can cause instant permanent eye damage. If you must observe near the sun, you need a certified solar filter specifically designed for your instrument. No exceptions. Right. Safety first and for the photographers. Any quick tips? Sure. 
A DSLR camera on a tripod is a good start. A wide-angle lens helps capture the comet and its surroundings. If you have a tracking mount, that's even better for longer exposures to really bring out the tail detail. Long exposures. Yeah, experiment with those. They can reveal the difference between the, uh, the dust tail, usually curved and yellowish, and the ion tail, which is often straighter and bluish, captures that dynamic interaction with the solar wind. Cool. Okay. Shifting back to the science, yeah. what does C2025R2 actually teach us? You mentioned Fred Whipple's dirty snowball idea from 1950. That's still the fundamental model. It's a nucleus of ice mixed with dust and rock. And C2025R2's rapid brightening is a textbook example of outgassing. The sun heating it up. Precisely. Solar radiation hits the nucleus, turns the ices directly into gas sublimation, and this gas drags dust particles off with it, creating the coma, the fuzzy head, and the tails. Have you tell what ice is? Ideally, yes, through spectroscopy. Big telescopes, maybe the very large telescope down in Chile, can split the comet's light into a spectrum, like a rainbow. The patterns in that spectrum reveal the chemical fingerprint. So we'd expect water. Water vapor is usually dominant, yes. Nice. But also things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, maybe ammonia, methane, plus silicates, the rocky dust component. It's basically a sample of the raw materials from the solar system's birth. And those two tails you mentioned, dust and ion. Right. The dust tail is made of heavier particles pushed gently by sunlight pressure, so it tends to curve along the comet's orbit. The ion tail is gas that's been ionized, stripped of electrons by the sun's UV light, and it gets blown straight back by the solar wind, always pointing away from the sun. It glows, often blue, because of fluorescing ions like carbon monoxide. Fascinating. And the fact that this comet survived perihelion is significant, right? Unlike C2025F2. Very significant. Many comets don't survive such a close pass. They fragment or fizzle out. Its estimated size, maybe one to two kilometers across, based on brightness models, probably gave it enough stuff to withstand the heat and gravitational stress. What happens next? Does it just fade away? Generally, yes. After its closest approach to Earth on October 19th, it will be moving further from the sun and further from us. So it should gradually fade through late October and November. But Comets can be unpredictable. Sometimes they have outbursts. Okay, so keep watching. But wait, there's another potential spectacle linked to this comet. A meteor shower. Ah, yes. This is one of the really exciting possibilities. Around October 5th, Earth is predicted to cross the orbital path of C2025R2. Meaning we run into its trail of debris. Exactly. Comets constantly shed dust and small particles along their orbit. If Earth plows through that stream, those particles burn up in our atmosphere as meteors. Streaks of light. Like the Perseids or the Leonids. Precisely. The Leonids, for instance, are linked to Comet Temple Tuttle. So we might get a brand new, albeit probably temporary, meteor shower from C2025R2. How intense could it be? It's hard to say for sure. It depends how much debris the comet ejected, especially near perihelion when it was most active. Estimates range from maybe a minor shower, 10, 20 meteors per hour. So cool to potentially a stronger outburst if there are denser clumps of material. Amateur meteor watchers are already busy about it online, planning observations. Groups like the American Meteor Society will be trying to collect data. So mark calendars for early October. Very cool. Definitely some to watch for. Beyond the immediate show, what are the kind of longer term implications? What does this comet mean in the grand scheme? Well, as a long period comet from the Oort cloud, it's like a time capsule. It carries relatively unchanged material from the birth of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. So studying it helps us understand our origins. In a way, yes. Its composition tells us about the conditions in the outer nebula where it formed. Its orbit helps refine our models of the Oort cloud itself, how big it is, how many objects are there, how they get perturbed inwards. Does it inform space missions? Absolutely. Data from comets like this feeds directly into planning for missions like ESA's Comet Interceptor. That's launching around 2029, designed specifically to visit a pristine, long-period comet, maybe one that hasn't even been discovered yet. C2025 R2 is like a practice run, observationally speaking. And is there any planetary defense angle? Comets hitting Earth? It's a minor factor for this specific comet. Its orbit isn't threatening. But studying any comet, especially one this size, improves our general understanding of their orbits, their structure, how they might break apart. All that knowledge indirectly contributes to assessing and potentially mitigating future impact risks, though asteroids remain the primary focus there. Right. It's amazing how much science comes from one visitor. But there's also the human side, isn't there? Comets have always grabbed our attention. Oh, absolutely. 
Throughout history, they were often seen as, well, omens, sometimes good, often bad. Like Halley's Comet and the Bayou Tapestry, 1066. Classic example, seen as predicting King Harold's defeat. Ancient Chinese astronomers kept meticulous records for centuries, linking comets to floods, famines, or the fates of emperors. It was deeply woven into culture. But now, in 2025, C2025 R2 appears. And it's different, isn't it? It is. It's happening in this incredibly connected digital world. Instead of superstition, the immediate reaction is scientific curiosity and shared observation. That sense of awe and wonder is still there, absolutely, but it's channeled differently. You see it online, right? That Edwin Quayle ex post you mentioned, over a thousand retweets, hundreds of comments already. Hashtags like hashtag Comets125B, hashtag Skywatch2025 are probably trending as we speak. Exactly. It reminds me a lot of the public enthusiasm for Comet Neowise back in 2020. People were sharing photos, tips, observations globally, citizen science in action. So this comet could genuinely inspire people, especially younger people. I really think so. Seeing something like this, relatively bright, accessible with binoculars, it can be a gateway. Like the Apollo missions sparked interest in space, a bright comet can spark interest in astronomy, and just looking up, wondering about our place in the universe. This raises an important question then. What does this whole event, the discovery, the reaction, tell us about where comet observation is heading? It's a fascinating snapshot, actually. It shows the power of existing tools like Soho Swan, but also their limitations that Holacek affect blind spot. So what's next? Better telescopes. We're definitely getting them. The Verici Rubin Observatory in Chile is coming online fully soon, maybe even this year or next. Its whole mission is to survey the sky wider, deeper, and faster than ever before. It should find many, many more faint objects, potentially including comets hidden near the sun. And technology like AI. That's playing a bigger role, too. Companies like uh, XAI and others are developing algorithms to sift through the massive amounts of data from these new surveys, potentially spotting faint comets or anomalies much faster than humans can. Real-time tracking could be revolutionized. But does that mean amateurs like Basugli become less important? Not at all, I think. Okay. If anything, this discovery highlights their continued importance. They provide crucial follow-up observations, they fill gaps, they notice things the algorithms might miss, and their passion drives public engagement. Platforms like the Comet Observation Database, COBS, or Zooniverse rely heavily on citizen scientists. So it's a partnership, really. It has to be. And hopefully the excitement around C2025R2 might even encourage more funding and support for these collaborative efforts, bridging the professional and amateur communities. What an incredible journey we've taken with this comet, C2025R2, SWAN. From that lucky discovery by an amateur. Serendipitous. To the science it's revealing about, well, the dawn of the solar system, its tricky path near the sun, and even that potential meteor shower coming up. It really covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? It does. It's this fleeting visitor, mm -hmm. but one that's being watched and documented by this amazing global network of people. So seriously, we really hope you, listening now, get a chance. Grab those binoculars, use an app, look towards Spike It tonight, or in the coming nights. Give it a shot. The universe is calling, and C2025R2 is its, well, its current messenger. Beautifully put. And, you know, if we connect this to the bigger picture one last time... It leaves you with a thought, doesn't it? Building on that Holacek effect, the near sun blind spot, and the power of just one person noticing something unusual. What's that? So what does this all mean for you? Well, it makes you wonder, what else is out there? Hidden in the glare, or just lurking in a patch of sky we haven't surveyed closely enough, waiting for another keen eye, another Vladimir Bezogli to spot it. What questions will the next unexpected visitor force us to ask? Hmm. Food for thought. Definitely. Keep looking up. Keep asking questions. That curiosity is what drives discovery.